Where does maritime security come from? What is this, its history? In this brief video, I'd like to introduce you to uh, the core developments as it concerns maritime security. My name is Christian Buber. I'm a professor of international relations at the University of Copenhagen and also one of the directors of the Safe Seas Network. Maritime security is a relatively recent agenda, a recent concept and a recent agenda. What is its history? In the following, I like to give you a brief history since the 1950s, and I like to focus on the main trends and developments on security at sea. And uh, it's really important to get that history straight uh, so we can see the continuities and relations of maritime security to earlier concerns. And I like to give you basically this overview by focusing on five distinctive periods. Here are my five major periods. The first one are the 1950s to the 1980s, and that's mainly a period uh, that is about decolonization and the Cold War. In the 1980s, the law of the sea is uh, concluded and uh, 1980s and 1990s are largely characterized uh, by the new hegemon and the US Navy, but also the rise of new problems. 2000 to 2008 is the age of uh, maritime terrorism, where this is the main concern. Starting from 2008, it is piracy, the golden age of modern piracy. Uh, and then roughly starting from 2012, with the decline of Somali piracy, we are entering the maritime security age, where the discussion is primarily about the concept of maritime security. In the short history that I would like to give you today, uh, I'd like to highlight a number of drivers of these developments and that these also justify to some degree the uh, different uh, eras I like to distinguish. One of the first core drivers are developments in technology and science and uh, that concerns navigation, but also containerization, for instance. Secondly, uh, the history of security at sea always has been a, a history of uh, resource exploitation or resource hunger. It is, however, also very much driven by the structure of the international system and global power distribution. So that really makes a core difference here. But primarily, and this is perhaps the factor that I like to emphasize the most, it is also a history of a changing awareness of global problems. So each of uh, these periods uh, centers on a, a particular kind of problem and is usually linked to the emergence of a, of a new type of uh, what is problematic at sea. Now let's get started. Um, the first period, 1950s to 1982, uh, characterized first of all by a decolonization kicking off in the 1950s. And uh, that uh, means that there are many more new states that uh, participate in ocean governance. So uh, a multiplication of uh, actors that each has their stake and uh, claims a particular role in security relation. We also see the acceleration of global trade, global shipping, and uh, that is mainly caused uh, by developing the modern uh, container uh, system. So the standardization that uh, took place here. Also, there's a major uh, development in terms of fishing and navigation uh, technology, and that leads to a substantial increase in fishing activities and much more exploitation of uh, fishing uh, resources. We also see a substantial increase uh, in technolo technological developments if it comes to offshore resource exploitation. So here we're talking about uh, oil platforms and uh, 
and gas uh, uh, mainly. This period was also clearly driven by the, the Cold War. So we're talking about a bipolar uh, international system. And part of this Cold War was also very, very much a quest for, for naval dominance, uh, for sea control and uh, thinking in terms of spheres at, uh, of influence. And uh, a related problem here is, uh, is also the question of uh, nuclear weapons of war, uh, uh, nuclear weapons at, uh, at sea. So here we are talking in particular uh, about submarine, submarine warfare. And there were several uh, declarations, for instance, of nuclear free zones. So that was a core concern in that particular area. So to, to sum this period up, what were the main concerns in the 1950s and uh, up until the 1980s? It was mainly a state-centric uh, era. So the core concerns were interstate uh, disputes over resources and uh, mar marine dominance. And uh, a core challenge here in better uh, regulating uh, the oceans were contested marine boundaries. Who has to the right to exploit the oceans where? Now, uh, this period ends uh, in my classification in 1982 because that saw uh, the conclusion of the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea and that settled many of these questions as it pertains in particular to boundaries and the freedom of uh, navi navigation. What changes in the 1980s and 1990s? We get, uh, get a range of developments uh, here. Uh, first of all, we see the emergence of uh, peacekeeping with naval components, uh, in particular in Iraq in 1991, but then also Somalia 1992. So we see a re-evaluation here of how navies can actually be uh, used. Increasingly, in particular starting in the, in the 1980s, uh, we see the consequences of the massive expansion of maritime activities and resource exploitation. And uh, because of that, uh, the environmental problem that this causes are increasingly becoming obvious and that links both to uh, pollution, but also the recognition, uh, recognition that fish stocks are in decline. So overall, there's much more attention now to uh, environmental concerns at sea and that these need to be uh, addressed. We are also, uh, with the 1990s, we're entering a new era where the Cold War is over and uh, that initially implies less naval contestation. And in exchange uh, for that, it is clear who is the naval hegemon, and that is the United States and its uh, Navy. In the mid 1990s, however, we see the first uh, modern piracy uh, outbreak, uh, so to say. Piracy in the Strait of Malacca and Singapore is now uh, recognized not only as a, a, as a local problem, but actually as a regional problem that uh, requires uh, international uh, solution. So that is also, also new here. So the focus shifts much more to uh, policing the sea environment. The environment becomes uh, a, a huge and important dimension of the maritime and security uh, at sea. And we also see the first uh, concerns over, over piracy emerging there. It changes uh, uh, a little bit in the uh, 2000s, uh, which can be uh, said to be the age of maritime terrorism. And a crucial moment here in the maritime sphere was the first major maritime terrorist attack that took place in 2000 on a US naval warship uh, in the Gulf of Aden. And, uh, these kind of concerns were quite obviously accelerated with uh, the terrorist attacks of September 11th. And here the fear was clearly that the, uh, the next large scale terrorist attack could be on a maritime target, for instance, uh, using uh, a tanker to attack a, a port. Uh, 
So those were major, major concerns. Um, you also, during that time, you see new uh, maritime initiatives in emerging and uh, above all the non-proliferation initiative and the idea to control uh, containers and uh, inspect trade flows in particular for um, the, the trade uh, in components uh, for potential weapons of mass destructions. And th those concerns uh, led to also to major port security efforts and uh, a core new legal instrument, the so-called ISPS code under the IMO, which is meant to increase port security. So in this period, clearly major concern, terrorism uh, at sea, then also you, you see quite a substantial debate on the relationship between uh, piracy and terrorism, particularly with an eye on uh, Southeast Asia. How do these feed into each other? Uh, are they the same? And, uh, and questions such as that. The smuggling of uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, becomes a core uh, concern, particularly driven by the by the hegemon, by the, um, the by the by the United States. And during that time, you also see the initial emergence of a first wave of Somali piracy, although it was not recognized as a major uh, concern. That fundamentally changes uh, after uh, 2008, where piracy then became more or less uh, uncontrollable. And it was clear that uh, massive international efforts were actually needed to address uh, piracy off the coast of Somalia. The UN Security Council got uh, involved for the first time ever to address uh, maritime crime. And uh, Somali piracy led to a multilateral global concerted effort which was uh, also very, very uh, successful. This is also why the, the, this period more or less uh, ends in, uh, in 2012, because by 2012, um, piracy of the coast of Somalia was largely, largely under, uh, under control because of these efforts. In a very interesting way, uh, counter piracy also led to new forms of collaboration between the shipping industry and states. Um, in particular, uh, collaborations between navies and, uh, and the shipping industry. And that was largely uh, uh, driven by, by piracy. During that time, there's also heightened attention and an escalation of uh, piracy in the Gulf of Guinea. And that's mainly uh, piracy uh, stemming from Nigeria. And also the UN Security Council then starts to, to address uh, piracy in that region. One of the main responses uh, to piracy was also a private response. So we see a significant boom in private uh, security companies that provide uh, services to, to the uh, shipping industry. And uh, ever since, uh, there has been an expensive use actually of private uh, security companies. So they have, so, so to say, uh, entered the picture as a new uh, actor of security at sea. Um, as the main concerns in that period, I would uh, suggest uh, that it was Somali, Somali piracy that drives, drives the agenda. And uh, quite substantial research has been actually here carried out on the relationship of state failure and piracy that later feeds into more uh, general uh, discussions of how state failure or uh, degradation actually leads to maritime insecurity and, uh, and blue crimes. So that, is, uh, that increasingly became a broader uh, debate. Finally, uh, 2012 to today. Um, today we are now living in the, <clears throat> in the age of maritime security, piracy, uh, is no longer a major concern if it uh, comes to Somalia, but it continues to be a concern in the Gulf of Guinea and also Southeast Asia. And there are also uh, continuing fears that uh, Somali piracy is not completely gone, but it might spike again. So the, um, the operations more or less continue uh, since 2012. 
But quite a number of other issues uh, have popped up. And uh, here I would like to flag uh, the migration crisis in the Mediterranean. People smuggling uh, became a main issue directly affecting uh, Europe. And some of the measures actually that were adopted to uh, deal with piracy now are also being used in the, in the Mediterranean Sea, such as uh, stronger collaborations with uh, the shipping industry. We see the emergence of new smuggling routes, in particular heroin coming out of uh, Afghanistan is now smuggled via the sea rather than the land, and that is uh, largely linked to broader development in the, in the Middle East. So the uh, smuggling route via the sea become more profitable. And that, of course, also has consequences then for the African continent uh, where this smuggling route passes by. Um, in this period, we also see uh, gradual shifts in the geopolitical conditions and uh, a growing naval contestation largely linked to the uh, rise of India and China as naval powers. The uh, South China Sea becomes a main area of concern, but simil similarly, uh, there are also new uh, concerns over what is going on in the Arctic or in the, in the Baltic Sea, and that uh, largely is linked to uh, Russian naval activities. For instance, you get concerns over submarine data cables and the potential that the Russian Navy <coughs> could uh, use uh, that to its advantage by tapping into these cables. I'm calling this the age of maritime security because a lot of things are happening also on governmental uh, level. Piracy to some degree was a wake up call and uh, now governments recognize that they need to reorganize their responses to maritime security. And uh, we see this primarily in the proliferation of maritime security strategies, strategies dedicated to uh, maritime security that pop up in different uh, uh, countries of the world. And uh, part of what is in the background here are, is the recognized need that uh, then there has to be better intra-governmental, but also regional coordination if it comes to maritime security. The last uh, major trends, uh, and that is perhaps more recently that I would like to flag, are growing concerns over the impacts of illegal fishing activities and how these activities also reinforce maritime security more generally. So. Here we see a substantial expansion of the, uh, the items on the maritime security agenda. And in that sense, uh, the main concerns now are how to deal uh, with this complexity of uh, maritime security, the diversity of threats and concerns, um, and that are, that are issues uh, we will uh, discuss further in forthcoming uh, videos. And a core concern now is also capacity building. That is how to assist uh, countries that do not have the capacity <clears throat> to uh, protect their coastlines and ensure maritime security in stepping up their game. And a lot of international activity is now concerned with uh, capacity building. So this characterizes the, uh, the contemporary phase and it's now time to wrap up um, in this brief video. I gave you a short history of maritime security. This is to underline that maritime security has come from somewhere and that there are a number of trends uh, which are linked to it. Overall, we can say it's very much of a history of a growing number of uh, global problems that are associated with maritime security. And that has led uh, to a substantial uh, complexity of maritime security. I hope <clears throat> that I achieved in giving you a good understanding of how things have developed since the 1950s. 
I would like to invite you to watch other episodes, visit our website, and also uh, follow us on Twitter. Thank you for listening.